OK, so let's hope we keep to time. The first topic is seal disturbance legislation. Um, if, sorry, before we start, I'm just going to go back. Apologies for this. Uh, I just want to say that tonight I feel massively honoured and privileged. Uh, I think somebody's recording it, but that's fine. I've allowed you to record it. Um, I feel honoured and privileged in order to be able to be here tonight and to be joined by such an incredibly diverse but extremely talented and ex ex uh, experienced people who are brilliant experts in their field. Um, it's just such an honour to know these people and it's just brilliant that they're willing to share their knowledge with us tonight. So it is with genuine delight that I am able to chair this meeting. It's just wonderful. So thanks ever so much. First up is Mary Tester from Thames Seal Watch, who uh, we're splitting the talk between us about seal disturbance legislation. And this is the summary of what we have been doing in order to try and make seal disturbance illegal as it is with whales and dolphins. And uh, it's a, been a long road, to be fair, uh, but we're getting somewhere. So I'm I'm going to talk about the white bits and Mary is going to talk about the, the dark green bits. And between us, hopefully we will speak for less than eight minutes. Over to you, Mary. Give me a shout when you want the slides to move on. Thank you, Sue. Um, I think pretty much everybody in this room knows about Freddie Mercury. So I'll just kind of sum it up briefly and kind of how I got involved in all of this. Um, but he was obviously, you know, a very beloved local seal in London. And I think, you know, we have, there's lots of seals in the UK. Unfortunately, there's lots of dog attacks on seals in the UK, but there's several reasons that I think he stood out and why this story stood out. I think one of them being is the fact that he called London Thames home, which I think in itself is, is kind of, unusual, uh, not that we don't have seals, but that a lot of people didn't realize we had them because they don't tend to haul out along the Thames. Um, I think also it was the timing. It was during lockdown and a lot more people were using the towpath for their daily exercise. And where he would haul out every day was very close to that towpath. And he didn't seem bothered by the public. So they got a, a pretty good look at him. And he brought the community a lot of joy and humor. Um, and he was fascinating. So I think that's what made it all the more devastating is um, how he was taken from us when he was so loved. Um, and also the fact that it was caught on camera. You know, these, these photos are really brutal. Um, and that in itself is a rarity to capture a moment like this. And of course the press ran away with it as they do, because it's a big story. Um, and I think what angered the community the most and myself included is the fact that we all kind of felt powerless in doing anything about it that there wasn't legislation in place to be able to prosecute the owner of the dog when quite clearly this seems like a crime. Um, being one of the medics at the scene, I felt a tremendous amount of guilt for not being able to help him more. And so I felt it uh, necessary to start a campaign to kind of strengthen seal laws for him, but to also prevent what happened um, from happening again. Um, so initially, I was hoping to give Tem seals the same protection that the deer in Richmond Park had, so keep it at a local level. Um, and I was talking to Dan about this and Dan Javis said, you need to talk to Sue. And of course I fell in love with her right away and told me about all the incredible work the Seal Alliance was, was doing, but also um, opened my eyes to the fact that this sort of dog attack happens all over the UK and not just with dogs, but with drones and vessels and people and you know, with all the stampedes that happen in Cornwall. So this was clearly a much bigger issue and this needed national exposure and a national campaign. Um, so I quickly joined the Seal Alliance and we've been working very diligently on this for the past, God, two and a half years. Um, and the first thing we did was start a petition, a government petition, which I think is key to note that it's not something on change.org. If you want something done, it has to be government because if you have 10,000 signatures, government has to respond. If you have 100,000 signatures, it's an automatic debate. Um, so thanks to the group and dispersing it in our local patch, we were able to get over 26,000 signatures representing every constituency, which is huge because it showed that no matter where people were, they agreed that this was an important issue worth tackling. So after the petition, we did the early day motion, which is basically, um, 
kind of a way to formally introduce an issue to Parliament um, and show what kind of MP backing you have for that. And we needed 12 MP signatures, which we got fairly quickly. And again, cross party support. We had represent representatives from every party uh, in politics showing again, this is a national issue that everyone can get behind. Um, and so after that, we did the 10 minute rule bill, which was one of the best days of my life and is MP Tracy Crouch, also now CBE, um, who brought this to parliament. And we had Rebecca Powell, who's in the photo, who at the time was parliamentary undersecretary for DEFRA, incredible lady, which I know Sue will talk more about, um, probably one of the key players in all of this. Uh, we had all the BBC Spring Watch people posting about it in support on social media. We had lots of NGO support that signed the bill. And I think we all kind of thought from there, we're going to the next stages. But with this sort of stuff, anything can happen. So I, I think we all remember quite clearly in 2022, there was a bit of political chaos. And we went through a few MPs and a few cabinet shifts. And uh, we weren't quite sure if we were going to make it through or if all of the hard work was just going to fall through the cracks. Um, so fast forward to 2023, and there was a talk about a marine wildlife code happening, which Sue will get into. Um, but in the case that it didn't, we wanted to give government an extra nod, a little nudge, just to remind them that we need legislation as well, because we need something to police. So I asked my local MP, uh, Sarah Olney, uh, from Richmond Park, which was also the same constituency as uh, Freddie, um, and she agreed to do a debate in Parliament, which we did at the end of June against Fisheries Minister Mark Spencer, kicked his butt. Uh, and we had Tracy Crouch there to support, as well as Norfolk MP Recording Duncan Baker and, and George Eustace, who was amazing as well. Um, and so from there, I think I'll go ahead and let Sue talk and kind of fill in the blanks with all of the other things that uh, the incredible hard work that she's done in her neck of the woods, as well as the rest of the team and where we're at now. Thank you, Mary. Really good summary. Well done, hun, and very powerful message about Freddie Mercury. So um, any um, good campaign needs some evidence and expert inputs uh, for letters, reports and resources. We'd already, by coincidence, got some funding for the SEAL Alliance um, campaign, which was Give SEAL Space, and we produced a uh, sign and a leaflet. We've now distributed 84,000 of those around nationally. We did some political um, schmoozing, I suppose, with George Eustace and Rebecca Powell, who were at the time were Environment Secretary and Under Secretary. And we hosted visits here uh, down in the southwest so they could actually see seals and understand some of the issues because you only have to go to see seals somewhere and you are immediately aware of the issues. But then we wrote an open letter to government saying, you know, building on this uh, uh, MP awareness and the public awareness, we wrote an open letter to government signed by all these amazing organisations with some big names there too, which was really very uh, rewarding. And we wrote an open letter demanding again that we needed seal disturbance to be made illegal. And then rather to somewhat to our surprise, uh, I heard in a meeting with Natural England that the JNCC in their quinquennial review, their seventh one, had recommended and the red bits are the key bits which are highlighted that uh, grey seals and harbour seals and walrus, walrus should stay on the Wildlife and Countryside Act, but that grey seals and harbour seals and vagrant species should all be added. And as soon as um, they were added to the Wildlife and Countryside Act, that would make seal disturbance illegal. And that was in 2022. In 2022 as well, the EFRA committee um, had an inquiry about marine mammals. And when I read that they had the inquiry, I realised there was very little about seals in the UK on their inquiry. So the Seal Alliance submitted this. I'm not expecting you to read it. It's just something for you to look at. You can read it in the presentation at your leisure if you wish. But this is the letter that we wrote to the EFRA committee about seals and why they should be looking at seals as well as cetaceans and turtles, for example. And this was signed by lots of the Seal Alliance members. And then we sent all this evidence up to the EFRA committee. 
The EFRA committee met and uh, Orca, Lucy Baby at Orca, was really incredible in championing the SEAL message. And I'm delighted to say that as a result of our evidence, the Sea Mammal Research Unit were invited to participate in the inquiry as well. Um, we continued to invite our local MP and a lot of the SEAL Alliance groups have engaged with their local MPs to keep doing a constant nudge about this being an important issue. And uh, then, fantastically, had been working behind the scenes, Lara Turtle, who is the SEAL's policy advisor, had been heading up a voluntary Marine and Coastal Wildlife Code, which DEFRA published on the 24th of May 2023. We're absolutely delighted about this because the majority of our work is awareness raising work. However, we need to have legislative backup because there was one case study in 2022 in North Wales where there was some deliberate disturbance of seals and the police wanted to act, but they could only use civil legislation in order to do that because seal disturbance wasn't yet illegal. So we did loads of press coverage. There's links here that you can click when we put the presentation live. We did that and um, amazingly, um, the following day, uh, the EFRA committee produced their report and it had this very powerful, it's making me tingle telling you about it, but this very powerful and important line in it in the summary on page eight. And it said, in the short term, seals should be added to the list of species in Schedule 5 of the Wildlife and Countryside Act as soon as possible. So we have taken that by storm. Um, and really tried to use that to push. I'm delighted to say that our involvement with the Wildlife and Countryside Link, which is a really cross terrestrial and marine organisation, also put in um, their response to the EFRA committee that, for example, seals should be added to the Wildlife and Countryside Act to protect them from reckless disturbance and the loophole that enables and the other stuff. So uh, that has been the sum of our campaign. What have we learned about effective campaigns? Because we're not there yet, but we are hopeful that we will cross the finish line fairly soon. But we need evidence. You have to collect a lot of evidence. We'd had masses of, of evidence from the southwest, from the northeast and from other areas of the country about seal disturbance. Freddie just brought it to everybody's memory. It's required a lot of teamwork. Persistence and determination, frankly, but the key thing is to have lots of contacts and partners who are willing to listen to your arguments and then if they agree with you, take it forward and support you. Um, we got widespread support and momentum and that's really quite critical. You need the momentum and then you need to use this persistence and determination to do these nudges and reminders with the decision makers. But key in right the way throughout the whole process is the words that you use, is the evidence, the words, the tone and the approach. And very often we get the tone and the approach wrong with the words. So having all of those uh, right is absolutely fundamental and key. Uh, and that's particularly important with a parliamentary petition. OK, so uh, hopefully in 2023, if not early 2024, we will have seal disturbance made illegal. Uh, fingers crossed, whole body crossed for that one. OK, over to Gareth Richards to talk about an investigator's toolkit, which is linked to the concept of disturbance. Uh, thank you, Sue. Um, and I totally agree with you. Um, I think, you know, we are so close to actually getting this over the finishing line. You know, I can I can I. I personally feel like I could sort of touch that that sort of final uh, bit there. But as you mentioned uh, earlier on, you know, our sort of thinking has always been, and will, it will continue to be, that of sort of providing education and sort of information to people, because I honestly believe that, um, you know, the public or people don't realise that their sort of behaviour is actually having or, or causing a disturbance to seals. Um, and when we are looking at a change in the uh, in the law or the strengthening of the law, we're not there to sort of criminalise people. In fact, it's far from it. But actually, there's a very, very small percentage of people who unfortunately should be part and parcel of the investigation sort of process and even prosecution at the end of it. Um, they are the sort of repeat offenders. Uh, but the big question for me is, you know, are the people who are tasked with investigating these uh, future offences being supported in the way that they should be? So in other words, you know, do they have the tools to do the job? 
Um, and just before Seal moves on to the next slide, I'm just going to say that I have purposely put in photographs of seals looking at the camera because it fits the context actually of what we're actually talking about because seals looking directly at the camera are the first sign of, of disturbance. So uh, next slide, Sue. Um, yeah, I, I, I've been quite fortunate really. I, I, I'm a, a, an ex-police officer and I know, uh, and I'll say this from the heart, it does hurt sometimes actually, but I know that some investigators are very, very limited on their experience of, of conducting uh, thorough and professional sort of investigations. And unfortunately, you know, over the past sort of 12, 18 months, we've certainly seen this within the SEAL Alliance. Um, plus recent research reports uh, have also sort of uh, highlighted this. Uh, but on top of that, you know, wildlife crimes have different complexities. Uh, therefore, like a one size approach uh, doesn't fit all. So it was important for us really to uh, create a very uh, supportive and a bespoke package to assist investigators. Uh, one which will broaden their sort of skills and their knowledge, not only at the time when they're investigating it, but for the future as well. Uh, next slide, Jim. Um, but we've supported Operation Seabird since it was launched in May 2021, I believe. Um, and this Operation Seabird was created to uh, reduce, uh, it was a campaign to reduce disturbance to all uh, sort of marine uh, wildlife and also as well to encourage the members of the public when they do see disturbance to report it to the police either on 101 or uh, sort of 999. So you know with a number of organizations and these are just a few sort of like working together it was important that you know once the legislation had been changed and the volume of incidents reported to the police had increased that we had all our ducks in a row, basically. Um, so we wanted to be well ahead of the game by supporting our investigators as as much as we uh, as much as we could. Uh, next slide, Jim. So um, the investigators' toolbox uh, or toolkit was um, was created, and uh, this basically um, will include um, some of these areas that I've actually got on the slide. But there will be quite comprehensive explanations, advice, and guidance under each of those sort of uh, topic headings. So, in effect, it's like an aid memoir. It's like you going uh, shopping and you obviously create a shopping list for yourself there. So, it's an aid memoir for these um, uh, these officers who are actually sort of, uh, or these investigators that are tasked with investigating this. And toolkits have been around for years. You know, I've used them uh, myself. Um, but this will be very specific to offences relating to, to SEALs itself. And um, when I first approached the um, National Wildlife Crime Unit, they were very supportive of us uh, creating this. And um, as long as it uh, passes their eyes, uh, their scrutiny, then it'll be uh, available to all investigators uh, across the UK. And I mentioned investigators because that's not just police officers, uh, because many sort of investigations these days are carried out by civilians, uh, also uh, police support staff, plus uh, as well our colleagues in the RSPCA, the investigators or any other uh, sort of um, organisation uh, as well. So what I'll actually do is I'll just give you a brief uh, example of each, and it will be brief because obviously we've got time uh, restraints. Um, the law itself, um, and I must be honest, you can't expect uh, all uh, investigators to know the ins and outs of the laws. Um, it's far too uh, complex. Uh, but the two main laws we're looking at is the Conservation of Seals Act 1970, and uh, Sue mentioned the Wildlife and Countryside Act in 1981 uh, earlier on. So they will be set out in a very sort of um, a clear way uh, and a very sort of simple format. Uh, the next one is um, mindset, investigative mindset, something I'm very sort of keen on myself. And really, it's about adopting a, uh, a systematic approach to the gathering and assessing of, of material that's gathered in any sort of investigation. And it's for the investigator to make sure that they fully understand what is in front of them and what it actually means. 
So possession, possessing an investigator's uh, mindset is actually sort of crucial. And I remember there's a, a mnemonic that uh, we used to use, and that was the ABC system, uh, which stood for uh, assume nothing, believe nothing, and confirm and check everything. That just makes sure yourself that you are actually on top of your inquiry. Um, initial report, I mean, this is creating this sort of positive relationship from the very outset. Um, and unfortunately, we, I think we sort of fallen foul of this over a couple of uh, inquiries that we've had to we've step into over the last 12 or 18 months. Now. But it's so important for the police really to contact the person reporting and convey from the very start a professional approach, you know, keeping people updated, for example, with relevant information, and not only providing a good service, but making them feel that they are receiving a good service, which is so uh, important. Again, witness accounts, uh, you know, getting these accounts recorded as soon as possible, whilst the memories are still sort of fresh and before they're likely to be contaminated, because your memory can be contaminated by you reading perhaps social media uh, posts or other sort of media outlets or speaking to other yeah. potential witnesses. They can't uh, hear you. Oh. Sorry, Sue. Can you hear no, it's me? okay. Yes, I can hear you. Fine. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, moving on to initial actions again. This is prioritizing what needs to be done. You know, some actions can be done in slow time. Oh, that they can't hear you. Sorry, I'm just trying to mute everyone. Okay, Thanks, Gareth. Off you go. Keep going. That's okay. Um, and there are other actions there. What, what we would call fast track actions. In other words, you know, you, if you don't secure that evidence quickly, it's going to be lost. Which I think moves on quite nicely to like scene preservation, because it's it's about ensuring that anything at the scene is recorded or seized before it is lost. Uh, and Sue has got a fantastic photograph actually, and I've used it and put a few presentations myself there. Um, an example I give would be the blood, the blood trails left on surfaces after seals have a stamp needed, which may need or should be for photographed or even at the end of the day swabbed before the tide actually sort of washes them away. I think there's 14 different sort of um, marks on that particular photograph scene. But most scenes are ideal for gathering evidence, and it's also important that the investigator uh, visits the scene uh, to familiarise themselves, uh, especially before any subsequent interview that's going to take place as well. Lines of inquiry, you know, again, is creating a plan. You know, it's, it's not rocket science. It's creating a plan of action uh, and what direction you are following. Um, an example line of inquiry would be social media posts because they, they are uh, a fantastic source of uh, evidence. Um, you know, what have they posted on their um, Facebook or some other social media site? And what comments have they made? You know, have they got other previous or relevant sort of convictions or, you know, their behaviour? Um, is there anything in their behaviour, quietness, which could be used as what they call as bad character evidence to show they've got a, a propensity to perhaps to commit uh, such, uh, such an offence? Um, sorry, Gareth, you've got one minute. Sorry. Okay, um, and again, it's a link between animal cruelty, which is most important, and child or domestic abuse. So it could well be the referrals have to be made uh, to that end. Again, photographic evidence, like we have Sue mentioned earlier about that uh, incident up in North Wales, uh, where someone filmed themselves, uh, disturbing, the, um, uh, disturbing the seals there. But of course, that evidence has to be interpreted. And of course, we've got expert witnesses which uh, a couple of weeks back, we were three of them. It's the first time it's ever been done within the uh, UK. Uh, Sue was one of those expert witnesses. Uh, and they are there really to uh, interpret uh, witness uh, uh, witness statements or uh, sort of evidence as well, photographic evidence, um, so that they give their opinion in, in court as well. And again, suspect interviews, um, I'll go past that very, very quickly. There'll be some sample questions there that they may well ask. But of course, that doesn't take them away from the fact that they should be taken or, or thinking for themselves as well. So what should happen really is that you base your next question on their last answer, if they are prepared to give any answers. 
And finally, the um, final report, how to put together uh, the final report for prosecution and will it pass the threshold test? And the threshold test is if there's sufficient evidence uh, available for the likelihood of a, uh, a realistic prospect of a conviction. Um, and all reports really should reflect the professional and thorough investigation from the start. And the final side too. You know, not to forget at the end of the day that the whole purpose here is to protect girls uh, like this one. And, uh, you know, we want them to experience a life where disturbance is, is very much a thing of the past. And um, I'm sure that most of us here this evening uh, uh, have dedicated ourselves to giving SEALs a voice. And I suppose this is our commitment in as much as uh, creating this investigator's toolkit to achieve in that. I would just finally like to thank uh, sort of Mary and Sue for their efforts in speaking up uh, for SEALs. And um, I'll be more than happy to take any questions, just put them in the chat box after, and I'm sure that Sue will go through them and um, we'll revisit them a little bit later on. Uh, thanks for listening, and I hope it's been of interest to you. Lovely. Thank you, Gareth. It's very, very important work. And by all means, do put questions in the chat and hopefully Gareth might even be able to answer some of those real time for you, too. OK, so research into grey seals in terms of PCBs. Um, PCBs are a chemical that were banned in the 1980s and uh, are persistent in the marine environment. But I want to go back a few steps before I tell you about more about PCBs in seals. So basically, because we're lucky in Cornwall, we have the Cornwall Marine and Wildlife, sorry, start again. We have the Cornwall Marine Strandings Network run by the Cornwall Wildlife Trust. Because we have that, we have excellent reporting of dead seals around our coast. And uh, one of the things we're able to do because of our photo ID work here in the southwest is identify dead seals. Between 2005 and 2023, we had 40 seals, only 40 out of the hundreds that have died, but nevertheless, 40 that we were able to provide additional data on in terms of their age and their sex, some of the issues in terms of entanglement and some of the positives in terms of rescue and rehab. And I know there's a lot on this slide, but if I just draw your attention to the fact that we only identify between one and five seals every year, despite a huge team effort on this, uh, most of the dead seals go unidentified. And then you can see in the pie chart that most of the seals that we've identified, which is very counterintuitive because females have better patterns, most of those were males, the dead seals were males. And we started looking at the ages of the stranded seals. And bearing in mind that the average life expectancy for a female is uh, 30 and for a male it's 25, you can see that we were having a lot of youngster seals dying. And when we really started to drill this down, we realised that under the age of 10, we had a, a lot. It's still a small sample, I know, but we had more males than females. And between the age of 10 and 20, we had more males than females. So we started to look into these um, PCBs uh, and started to question uh, whether this was having an influence on our seals. And there is some research here. I have put the link in the presentation. So you'll be able to follow it up if you wish. But basically the impacts of these toxins or pollutants on seals are that they lower vitamin A, which impacts thyroid hormone development, which impacts you hugely. I'm hypothyroid, I don't have enough thyroxine, I have to take tablets daily, otherwise my health would deteriorate very quickly. But if you have enough thyroxine, then you can live a perfectly happy uh, life with minimal impacts. They have immunosuppression um, effects and they also have reprodu uh, reproductive impacts, reducing reproduction, um, particularly in males. Sure, you're not going to like this, but in terms of reducing the size of testes. So there are all sorts of serious impacts of PCBs. And I'm delighted to say that in 2022, an organisation called the Debs Foundation, which are a charity, came to us and said, what research could we fund? And it was very quick to see that the ideas I'd come up with wouldn't work from their levels of interest. However, I suddenly realised that if I spoke to British Divers Marine Life Rescue and I spoke to the Wildlife Trust Strandings Network and I spoke to other organisations such as CSIP, that in actual fact, um, we might be able to make some progress with the research. So PCBs popped into my head. 
And I said, OK, let's um, explore this. And we met with David from the Debs Foundation and he agreed a certain amount of money that would fund eight. Uh, gray, uh, sorry, it looks like seven Grey Seal postmortems. Yes, seven Grey Seal postmortems. It, it's about £800, I think, for a seal postmortem, um, not the postmortem itself, but the analysis of the results. So it costs an awful lot of money. And now I've said it, I'm not wondering if it's three to eight hundred pounds. I'm not exactly sure, but basically we could only afford seven sets of samples to be done. And to cut a very long story short, when the results came out, CSIP, the Cetacean Strandings Investigation Programme, were surprised, as were we in lots of respects. We expected that PCB levels would be high in seals, but we were surprised pleased not the right word but at least it, it meant that we'd been right about this being a potential issue for seals the yellow line on the graph shows what the low toxic threshold for effects like that immunosuppression the vitamin a and um, all the other impacts that it has on seals that's the the low threshold for effect and the red line is the high threshold for effect and what we found was that Seven, apologies, it was eight, seven of the eight grey seals that were anal analysed actually were above the low threshold and three were above the high threshold for toxic effects. So people were surprised but very interested and this will be a future line of interest. Now, why is this so important? Well, I'm just going to bring it back to seals, really. So basically, if you have a first time mum, she has these toxins in her body, as does a male. The first time mum is a very lucky creature because she is able to offload her toxins into her first pup. They're a lipid fat based toxin that gets passed through the mum's milk into the pup. Actually, probably um, poisons the pup and kills the first pup. However, thereafter, the mum's PCB levels are low and she is therefore able to have subsequent pups who thrive. Males never get a chance to offload their PCB levels, which is why we looked at males for this particular example. So their toxin, toxic, toxicity builds up over time and PCBs have a really significant effect on them, particularly in terms of their ability to reproduce. So it's work in progress. It was literally just a start. A sample of seven isn't enough, but we are hoping that CSIP will be able to get money with CFAS in order to further that research and to find out more. OK, uh, over to the next speaker then. So we've done a bit about issues in grey seals. Uh, this is an issue in harbour seals. Nat Arrow, over to you. Lovely, thank you very much, Sue. Um, so I am going to jump straight in because even a brief summary of this project is quite difficult to fit into a few minutes. Um, so I'm going to take you quite rapidly through an outline of this study into mouth rot in harbour seals. Um, sorry, can we just go back a slide? Sorry, Nat. Sorry. Um, I was just going to say, you know, unfortunately, I don't have time to explain the specific contributions of all of these really amazing people and organisations, but needless to say that this is a really, really big team effort and I'm extremely grateful to all of them. Next, please. Okay, just some uh, background information first then. So we quite commonly do see seal pups in general presenting with issues in their mouth. And often this is a result of some trauma happening that then introduces uh, an infection sometimes. And then we have these hard palate ulcers in particular, um, so the ulcers on the roof of the mouth, which are historically quite common in weaned harbour seal pups. And this has always been thought to occur because of minor wounds being caused uh, and infections developing as a result when pups are learning to forage and perhaps picking up inappropriate objects. Uh, and some of these ulcers can be really uh, quite nasty, as you can see here. Um, and so if this is quite a common presentation in harbour seals and we've got a good theory as to why it happens, it's obviously sensible to ask why are we investigating it at all? The reason is because in the last few years we have seen a really worrying uh, rise in the number of harbour seal pups presenting with these oral lesions uh, and a really worrying number of them have been in such a bad condition that we've actually needed to euthanise them straight away. Um, so we launched an investigation uh, to help determine the definitive cause of the condition and why case numbers seem to have increased. 
the possible population level impacts and if we can do anything to help manage the condition at all. So I'll just show you here how these cases typically uh, present. Um, so usually they have one or more of the following signs. The first is a swollen muzzle, like in the top photo here. And the second is the presence of wounds around the face and lips that might uh, obviously be infected as well. Just click for me, please, Sue. Oh, sorry. Uh, that's fine, yeah. And then thirdly, uh, we see these ulcerations uh, that I mentioned on the, the hard palate. Um, we do see them particularly on the hard palate, but we can see them in other areas as well. And these can progress to really quite large areas of soft tissue erosion. And click once for more for me. Excellent. And this can eventually lead to the bone on the roof of the mouth being exposed. And this can then get infected and necrotic. So the bone tissue actually dies. And we can get oronasal fistulas forming um, where there is a connection between the mouth and the nasal cavity, which is obviously extremely serious. Um, and as you can imagine, you know, pups in the state have very severely compromised welfare. Okay, uh, so the next two slides will outline briefly the investigation efforts so far. Um, so this first became an issue back in the 2020 harbour seal season, um, and we collected a very small number of samples for analysis just before the season ended to start exploring if and how we might explore the issue further in the future. Um, the results prompted us to apply for funding from DEFRA for a pilot study in 2021, and we did manage to secure that funding. So during the 2021 harbour seal pupping season, we started the investigation properly. And this involved basically collecting as much information as possible about the affected pups. So we asked for forms to be completed about the pup, um, including a section for, for vets to fill in, um, for photos to be taken as well. If the pup unfortunately uh, died or it needed to be euthanized, then tissue samples were taken for analysis at the lab, um, led by Dr. Jamie Bojko, who's at the uh, National Horizon Center um, at Teesside University. And this data and sample collection has just been a huge task for our volunteers at British Divers Marine Life Rescue and many veterinary practices and rehab centres and others I don't have time to mention have just been extremely helpful in taking the time to assist the study. And then we repeated the whole process for the 2022 season and then earlier this year we thankfully secured additional funding from DEFRA uh, and now we are just coming to the end of our data collection period for 2023. So uh, what happens to these tissue samples at the lab? Um, well, our initial theory was that this condition was being caused by a virus or viruses, um, probably with secondary bacterial involvement as well. So we decided to explore this avenue thoroughly at first. Uh, Jamie at the lab, his area of expertise uh, involves something called metagenomic analysis, uh, which is basically looking for genetic material in samples. Um, in this case, we were looking for the genetic material of pathogens such as viruses and bacteria. So along with all that paperwork and photos being collated and analysed, the samples are also uh, effectively being scanned for the presence of pathogens. We'll come back to the pathogens in a moment, um, but I just wanted to share with you a rough idea of the number of cases and their distribution that we're seeing. Um, so in 2022, um, BDMLR attended 256 harbour seals um, and 113, so about 44% of those, were recorded as suspect mouth rot cases. Of those pups, 27% went on to rehab, although we don't know the long-term outcome for some of those pups, sadly, um, and 64% were euthanized, so a, a really significant proportion. 46% of cases were from Norfolk and Suffolk, so this appears at the moment to be a bit of a hotspot. Northeast England also had significant numbers, and then there were sparse cases seen in other areas as well, um, so like two in Scotland, one in Wales, one in Ireland. Um, but we do have to be really careful when interpreting this sort of information, and I don't have time to go into detail here today, but for example, there could be bias in terms of sampling efforts in different areas. So it's very interesting that we have to keep our eyes open. Going back to the lab findings, so far from the samples that we've processed, but there are lots more to go, we have found six new viruses and we've identified 56 different types of already existing bacteria. 
And this sounds like a lot, and initially it sounds very worrying, but we have to remember that it's extremely unlikely that all of these pathogens are involved with causing the disease or, or any disease even. Uh, and in fact, it might be that none of them are at all. As you can imagine, you know, even a normal mouth is, is filled with lots of different types of bacteria. So that's the next big task for us is trying to determine which, uh, if any of these pathogens uh, are actually involved with mouth rot. We currently suspect that mouth rot is a syndrome being caused by multiple different pathogens acting together or in succession um, rather than just one acting alone. So our next steps are to try and determine which pathogens are responsible, if any, and to develop techniques to uh, identify these pathogens more quickly and more cheaply. Um, we also want to continue our surveillance efforts and in the future, perhaps we're gonna be able to advise um, better on treating affected pups and maybe even managing the condition more widely. So thank you very much for listening. I appreciate I've only sort of skimmed the surface of this study and I've left a lot of questions unanswered. Um, so please, uh, if we don't cover anything today and you still have a question, feel free to drop it to this email address here. Um, and yeah, thank you very much for listening. So I'll hand you back to you, Sue. And Nat, that was incredible because I know it was a tall order to ask you to do that in eight minutes and you managed it. So very, very well done. Okay, I just need to stop my... Um, timer because I need to time myself which I managed to not do last time so apologies for that right on to climate change impacts on seals because obviously some of those issues affect some of our seals but climate change is the biggie that's potentially affecting large numbers of seals so we have a 23 year data set based at this particular site in uh, in West Cornwall and what we've discovered are some they're called phenology shifts, but they're just seasonal shifts in behaviour. If we look at the peak haul out season at this particular site, it used to be in March and April. And in the last two years, it's actually been in January and December. In contrast, the mackerel season at this bay has shifted later in the year. So we used to have mackerel season starting in the summer and now it starts in November. And that started to bring a spatial and temporal overlap between the fishery and the seals. And the consequence of this has been seals getting hooked in mackerel gear. Now, this is not through any fault, particularly of the mackerel fishers at all. We are not criticising this industry at all. But when you see a malted pup like this, who is unable to extend both rear flippers because the uh, hooks are caught not only in its rear flippers, but in its bottom and then up its tummy and into its body and on its back, you can see that this is a really unpleasant issue. We've had a lot of animals, um, a lot more animals. We never used to see this as an issue. And in the last two years, because of that a seasonal shift in peak haul out, we've started to get that issue. It's not just peak haul out that's been affected by um, seasonality, but also the pupping season. Initially, when I started this 23 years ago, October was the month where we had most pup births, followed by November. And in the last two years, it's been August followed, uh, sorry, September followed by August and basically the same happened in this year as happened last year which is peak pupping suddenly kicked off in on the 18th of August and it's been fairly relentless. So what are the other impacts of climate change? Well this is a rather sad video to be perfectly honest it breaks my heart when I take videos like this because this pup was not at a site where British Divers Marine Life Rescue could even think about doing a rescue on this particular day. But for example, in St Abbs on the East Coast, a particular storm, Storm Arwen, washed about 840 odd pups off a single beach in a single night, all separated from their mothers and therefore doomed. As a result of we're getting ocean heat waves uh, on average thought to be about four degrees C higher than we've ever had before. We're getting more red toxic algal blooms and these algal blooms produce a chemical called domoic acid and domoic acid has very severe consequences on the neuro ne the, the nervous system of seals. Uh, and when I went to the um, Marine Mammal Center in Sausalito in, in California, basically I saw an animal affected by domoic acid. It was a young harbor seal and it was effectively swimming. It looked like it was thinking it was swimming, but it was on the side of the pool in rehab. So it's devastating to see that impact. 
Um, also, we've had an increase in coastal erosion associated with extreme weather events. The graph orange line shows the number of seals that we saw last year in compared to the average. The rock fall that's shown in the photo happened in March. And basically what it did is it took that habitat, which is a really massive key site in North Cornwall, out of use for seals, all of them having to use more energy to find the next safe haul out. And on my particular site, we've been monitoring rock falls and we had one in 2019, one in 2020, four in 2021 and eight in 2022. And it only takes a small rock fall on this beach to kill a seal because you can see there's a seal sleeping here. We have no idea how many seals were actually killed in that rock fall. A few years ago, we had an absolutely mahusive one. Uh, rockfall that is these are two seal popping caves at, at popping season and a week later this is what the coast looked like so one of my favorite seals i'd last seen outside these popping caves i haven't seen her since that rockfall and as i said it only takes a small rockfall to kill a seal seas are full of storm sediment and basically for young juvenile seals who are now teaching themselves to feed they use eyesight and um, sensations going through their vibrissae through vibrations and basically um, they're if the sea is full of sediment they can't get the vibrations and they can't see making it even harder to work out what they should be eating and how they should be catching it storms also rip up uh, fishing gear that's left out if the uh, fisher wasn't expecting the storm or it came a little earlier than anticipated and forecast it rips up the gear and it makes shed loads more lost gear which of course then seals really struggle with and uh, can't get out of because the juveniles explore it they like kelp they think this looks like kelp feels like kelp until it's wrapped around the necks and then they're stuffed uh, this seal has got trailing material, which we've shown statistically significant increases the chance of uh, early death as a result. I'm delighted to say that on this particular day, I was able to call British Divers Marine Life Rescue and Dan Jarvis personally rec rescued this seal. But you can see it's pulling, it's cutting in at the back. There will be no wound underneath. There'll be a horrible wound at the back. And basically, um, she's choking because it's pulling on her as she's coming up the beach. Anyway, she was rescued, which is great. 2022 taught me two more extreme weather impacts on seals. I was in two hammering rainstorms. I hid during the first one. And when I came back, half the seals had gone. So I stood in the second hammering rainstorm. And in those two back to back storms, over half of the hauled seals rushed into the sea, presumably because Every whisker has 1,500 nerve endings. Their muzzles are very sensitive. They don't like hammering rain on their faces like we don't. And then I also experienced this seven minute worst ever hailstorm I've ever experienced. And I'm not allowed to show the cliff footprint and the beach footprint because I do not want to give away the site. So there aren't 292 spots on the left uh, photo, but on the whole beach, we'd started with 292 hall seals, and by the time we finished, there were 20 left. The seals didn't enjoy the hailstorm. So hammering rain, hailstorms and extreme weather are actually adding to rates of disturbance as well. If you want to see our short film about the impacts of climate change, you can watch our YouTube channel. I'll put the link in here. But the key thing is, this is something we can all do something about. And we use the acronym TEAMS, spelt wrong, just to hopefully make you think about it and notice we need to travel less, use less energy, eat more plant based local sourced food. If we have money to invest, we need to invest in ethical companies and then we need to share what we're doing with everybody else so that they can follow suit. We've got these leaflets. I am very happy to send them out to any organisation nationally who would like to share them. You just need to ask us and email seals at cornwallsealgroup.co.uk to get some copies sent to you for free. Together, we can reduce these pressures on our native seals, the mouth rot, the, the um, disturbance. We can reduce the impacts of climate change. And we can reduce the impacts of PCBs, but it's going to PCBs is the hardest one to solve, really. Um, we need to reduce the pressures. The easy one is the disturbance one, really. And the climate change is a key one we all need to take action in. Um, we need to reduce the pressures on our native seals because it's essential for our own wealth and health. 
We just need to take action now and we need to take one step at a time. Please do have a look at that film if you're interested. But it's not all bad news. So we're going to finish on a high with information about rescue, release and rehabilitation. If you're interested to know how successful rehabilitation is and how worthwhile and useful it is in terms of a conservation tool, then you can have a look um, at a Google Drive, which I'll put in the chat, where you can see the report that we published, peer-reviewed report that we published about um, the successes of uh, rescue and rehab and release. Okay, Dan, over to you. Uh, you're on. Um, yeah, I can hear you now. Lovely. Thanks, Dan. Okay, lovely. Uh, are you doing the slides? Is that all right? Yes, if you want me to do it, that's fine. Yeah, okay, okay carry on. Then. Um, uh, so, yeah, if you want to move ahead, one. Uh, thank you, everybody, uh, joining this evening. My name is Dan Jarvis, the Director of Welfare and Conservation at British Divers Marine Life Rescue. Uh, this evening, I'm just going to give you a whistle stop tour of some uh, data about our calls that we receive. Uh, regarding marine mammals and then we're going to delve a little bit more specifically into seals. So the chart that you can see at the moment is a overall call uh, chart and this is, I need to caveat this, this is the raw number of calls that we receive on our hotline every year for all species, so cetaceans and seals and other things that we sometimes get called about as well. So uh, just to be clear, this is not the number of animals that have been rescued. It's just the raw number of calls. And as you can see over the years, uh, up until 2021, uh, we've been experiencing a, a sort of a slow increase until that jump between 2020 and 2021 and things jumped up uh, quite massively that year. Uh, and then we've had a bit of a decrease in 2022, which was quite welcome. But at the moment, 2023 is ahead of the same point up to the end of August. This data goes for 2023. We're ahead of August 2021 at the moment. So not by much. So it's looking like it's going to be a similar year to 2021, if not possibly even a bit higher, which is obviously quite concerning. Now, if we move on to the next slide, Sue, we're going to break that down into the monthly data. Um, and uh, it's getting a little bit messy, this chart now, because there's so many lines and colours on it. But uh, you can follow 2023 quite easily there. Um, it's been a really, really exceptional August, as you can see, as that line ends on a massive high, uh, approximately double the next nearest August from the last few years. Now, what I should say at this point is that over 90% of the calls that we receive at BDMLR are about seals. So it is very, very heavily skewed towards them and their seasonality. So through autumn and winter and just into the early spring months is typically the time where we're getting a lot of calls about grey seals as it's their pupping season around the coast of the UK. And then when we get to the summer from sort of June and through July and into August, that's the time for the common seals. So we're getting uh, quite busy with the grey seals in the winter. December in particular is always horrendous. Uh, but August, for reasons that we're not quite clear on at the moment, I do need to go back and look in much more detail at our data uh, on this. But August has been really, really bad for getting calls, mostly, of course, about common seals. Uh, next slide, uh, please, Sue. Uh, so there's a number of reasons why increases are happening with the calls that we're receiving. Uh, some of this is just down to the increasing awareness and visibility of BDMLR and other uh, sort of seal rehabilitation centres, the RSPCA and so on. It's much easier to contact these organisations and find numbers for them when you stood on a beach with a smartphone, for instance. Uh, changing human population and activity is definitely having a big impact. Uh, the human population is increasing. We're spilling out into wild habitats more frequently through a number of different activities, whether that's boating, uh, coast steering, cliff walking or coast walking even, um, paddle boarding and kayaking, wild swimming. All of these activities have taken off massively, especially during the COVID years. But it's not just confined to the main holiday periods like it used to. It's year round now, including the winter, when we've got a lot more people on the beaches. And therefore, of course, 
a lot more chance that an animal will be found and reported. Uh, what also goes hand in hand with this, unfortunately, as has been mentioned earlier on, is increased disturbance, and that can impact negatively on the seals. Climate change has had effects, as Sue's just said, I won't go into any more detail on that, just to keep on time. But uh, we've also heard this evening about mouth rot in common seals, and that's a relatively new phenomenon over the last few years, and that has been part of the increase relating to common seals in recent years. Thank you, Sue. This chart here is, this is brand new. You are the first people to see this outside of a small group of people uh, who saw it in the student's presentation earlier this week. Um, this has just been completed by a master's student at the University of Plymouth, and she has been looking at all of our call data between 2019 and 2022 inclusive. So the three charts you can see here relate to uh, pinnipeds. Uh, the left hand one, uh, map A, is for grey seals, which you can see cover most of the country as they're more widely distributed. Then the middle map B is for common seals, of course, more distributed along the east coast of the UK, parts of the west coast, particularly Scotland and North Wales, uh, and a little bit of the English Channel as well. And then the far right, just for fun, is walruses uh, in map C. Uh, so that gives you a good idea of where the majority of our call outs are happening. So much of our coastline, we're getting quite a lot of activity on. On the next slide, uh, we're going to see the outcomes of these calls between 2019 and 2022. Uh, again, I can't go into too much detail as we don't quite have enough time to look at every single outcome here, but you can see the uh, left hand column, the one that's got the biggest bars on it, uh, these are for animals that have either been checked by volunteers and found to be okay and left in situ, or perhaps needed some monitoring, but again ended up being left in situ. So you can see quite a lot of the calls, quite a large proportion of the calls that were getting regarding seals result in no further action being taken beyond a medic being sent out to go and have a look. Uh, if we move along to the next large batch of bars, you can see that's for no action necessary. So these largely relate to calls that we receive from members of the public where uh, from their description and photos and videos that they can send us on uh, the hotline coordinator side, that we can triage that animal and see that it is either completely fine and doesn't need us to send anybody out to it, uh, or sometimes it can relate to seals that are just sleeping in the sea and are completely fine uh, and other such circumstances as well, where it's pretty obvious the seal's quite happy as it is and we don't need to go and interfere with it. It can just be left where it is and there's minimal chance of uh, disturbance from people. Uh, moving along from there, you can see the next large batch of bars relate to animals that were picked up for rehabilitation. So uh, these, of course, are animals that have health problems, uh, whether it be that they're malnourished, injured, uh, entangled, had infections, eye problems, respiratory issues, all of those sorts of things uh, and more. Uh, and you can see that number uh, floats around between these years, somewhere between 300, just over 400. Um, and actually in the last few years, what was really interesting, a slightly decreasing trend. And this could be for a few reasons. One is that there are fewer spaces in rehab for seals, sadly, so it is pushing us to triage and monitor uh, more on the beach because there is less space for seals to go to. And quite a lot of the year, all of the seal rehab centres in the UK are completely full. Uh, so this is an issue that we are working on in the background. And you can see that might have had a bit of a knock on effect to the number of seals that are picked up for vet treatment. So they might go overnight or stay for a few nights and a vets have a short term treatment and get released back onto the beach again, rather than going in for rehabilitation as well. And then at the far end, we've got the animals that run away into the sea before we get there. And again, that might be by their choice or it could be due to public disturbance uh, causing them to go back into the sea as well. Uh, so quite a lot of interesting data in here. I say I wish I could spend more time on it, but uh, we'll keep to time tonight and move on. So I'm sorry, so, Dad, we've actually got only about two minutes. I'm really sorry. Oh, no problem. I'll probably That's give fine. you a little bit longer, but if you can, <laughs> yeah. 
So why rescue and rehabilitate? Um, well, it's, it's a really interesting topic that's come up a few times recently, uh, largely from the fishing industry saying that too many seals are being rescued and rehabilitated, or basically that all rehab and rescue should stop completely as it's interfering with nature. Um, so it's, it's led to some interesting discussions recently. So I thought I'd just try to tackle this again extremely briefly here, but we do need to look at things uh, historically uh, as well. So unregulated killing and culling of seals led to them becoming almost extinct in parts of the UK during the 20th century. This led to the creation of the Conservation of Seals Act in 1970, and the species in the UK have been recovering ever since. But we still have major other issues that impact on populations relating to entanglement, uh, bycatch, toxins, as we've heard about this evening as well, overfishing, climate change and disturbance. Uh, some really interesting facts that we've just pulled out and realise fully appreciate that these are not directly comparable as they're not the same year, but in 2015, a scientific study that was published estimated approximately 580 seals are by caught in gillnet fisheries alone in the UK, whereas in 2021, approximately 330 seals were released by rehabilitation centres in the UK. So looking at that statistic alone, there's still a huge uh, imbalance between what rehab contributes to putting animals back into the wild and for them surviving versus what humans are artificially taking out through one specific fishery and one specific threat. And when we look at other fisheries and when we look at all of the other threats in combination that humans cause towards seals and other wildlife, we can see that things are very, very out of balance. Uh, next slide, Sue. So there's a few points to consider here uh, in conjunction with that. Um, predator populations can only be supported by adequate prey populations. And UK seas, which hopefully is good news, seem to be doing quite well in recent years. We are hearing from fishers in certain areas that things are doing extremely well, but we're also hearing other areas where things are not going very well. But we are seeing large predator species such as bluefin tuna, large whales and common dolphins in increasing numbers around the UK. And there is somewhat of a lack of understanding of wild population dynamics by some, not all, in the fishing industry. And this results in things such as calls to coal seals and very recently have heard about coals for tuna being called for as well, which is quite interesting. Uh, we've heard comments that bycatch of marine mammals is a good thing to reduce their population and this is part of the reason why some fishers are not motivated to implement mitigation devices to prevent bycatch. And there are misconceptions about rehabilitation processes taming seals uh, and causing them to get caught in nets as well. Whereas uh, on the other hand we can see that fishers and angling trip operators in certain harbours around the country do sell or give fish to the public specifically to feed seals, which of course is what can tame them up uh, into uh, becoming habituated towards boats. Uh, and we also need to be aware, of course, that seals move huge distances from their release site post rehabilitation and throughout the rest of their lives. So releasing seals in one specific location doesn't mean seals in that specific location have an increase in population. That seal, for example, where I am in Cornwall, could end up in France, Wales, Ireland, or even the Isle of Man. So it's not that specific one small area that is being affected by seals being released. Uh, next slide, Sue. So I'll try and finish now. Thank you. <laughs> oh, sorry, there was a picture there. Uh, and then uh, we'll just finish here. This is the last slide that we'll show. Um, I just wanted to flag uh, another issue that we've had increasingly around some parts of the UK, which is entanglement in frisbees. Um, and we had one really unusual case of this very, very recently in Cornwall. So this is a seal known as Wings by Sue and volunteers at the Seal Research Trust. She frequents St Ives Harbour, where she is, uh, where she has been fed regularly for at least 10 years, uh, probably a lot more than that, and is completely habituated to being in very close proximity to boats within the harbour throughout the summer, uh, every high tide every day. So she is very, very used to humans. And it might be that because she is so habituated that she unfortunately a few weeks ago ent uh, got entangled in one of these uh, frisbees. 
because of her unique circumstances being so habituated, we actually had an opportunity with her to capture her, uh, which we don't with other seals in this situation because they are often in places that it is impossible for us to reach them. They are down uh, inaccessible cliffs, they are on islands and rocks where we would scare them before we get anywhere near to them. These are, one of the big, uh, these are some of the biggest issues we have in disentangling seals. They are often in places that we cannot physically get to them. But Wings was completely different because she was in the harbour. We were actually able to lure her into the tunnel uh, in the pier structure that you can see in the photos here with fish. I know that's quite bad of us, but we made an exception to save a life. And we then barricaded her in with a bunch of herd boards and allowed her to escape only by coming up into a cage where we were able to safely contain her and using bulk cutters, the Cornish Seal Sanctuary staff that were with ourselves at BVMLR managed to cut her free, uninjured as well, and release her straight back into the water. So it was a very unique case, probably a one-off, and just wanted to touch on why disentanglement is so difficult with seals. The logistics of getting to them and accessing them safely uh, make it almost impossible, but it is something that we continue to work on in the background. Uh, I think that's it from me. See, I'll, I'll end there so you can crack okay, on Okay, lovely. Time. Thank you ever so much. Uh, much appreciated. I'm sorry we don't have longer, Dan, because that was really fascinating. Okay, we're going to finish on a high. Uh, obviously, it syncs really nicely from Dan with Wings and her story into the Flying Rings campaign. And over to Jenny Hobson from Friends of Horsey Seals, who is going to tell you about how that campaign has progressed and developed. Hi, everyone. I'm Jenny. Can you can you hear me all right, Sue? Yes, yes we can hear you fine, Jenny. Sue, I'm currently at anchor in the wash with quite a few seals around. But that does mean that my connection is a bit unstable. So if it's cracking, you know, if it's breaking up and not working, um, please go ahead and just take over and, and finish it for me. Um, but I'll crack on. This is a, a quick resume of the campaign. What sparked it off, what we've done in Norfolk, how it's gone national through SEAL Alliance groups and what the next steps are. Thanks, Sue. This seal top left is the first one I'm aware of that was caught in a dog toy flying ring. Thankfully, British divers and um, Scarborough Sea Life managed to catch it, cut the ring off and release it in situ. Later that first year, friends of Bozzy Seals captured their first seal frisbee caught in a plastic flying ring. She was in a far worse state. She was starving to death because the ring she couldn't extend it to hunt. Amazingly, RSPCA East released her five months later. I also volunteer for RSPCA East Winch and the following year, Peter, she was at death's door and when I saw her, my heart broke and I felt I had to do something to stop this happening to other seals. I went to see Peter and friends of Aussie seals were happy to support an awareness campaign with crucially the message saying, please don't play with flying rings on the beach. It was supported by these groups. Okay, Sue. So. Jenny, I'm going to turn your camera off for you so that that will reduce the bandwidth issue, but you're coming through loud and clear now, all right? Okay. No, it seems I can't turn your camera off. Don't worry, do carry on. Okay, now the next slide, just flick them on, please. Oh, I think I, uh, that's one of the problems. I think basically I have put the slide on, but you can't see it yet. Sorry. Uh, okay, well, what I'll do is I'll, I'll talk through as best I can and just say if I'm, if I'm not syncing up with the slides. Um, yeah. So we got funding from Sea Changers and developed this friendly poster and leaflet with the help of a local wildlife artist. The leaflet explains how young seals find lost and discarded flying rings in the sea. Being curious, they play with them, sometimes put their head through the middle. As they get bigger and bigger, they can't get them off, and the ring digs deeply into the neck. 
causing the most horrendous injuries and eventually a long and painful death. The leaflet also explains how everybody can help. The term flying ring was chosen as a non-brand generic term for any sort of throwing ring with a, with a hole in the middle. Thanks, Sue. I'll, I'll keep talking. Uh, yeah, if you give me the thumbs up, I'll keep talking. We created a, then created a life-size sculpture of a grey seal with a ring embedded around its neck and took it on a coastal tour. And it was self-explanatory. Lots of people came to see it and realised immediately what the problem was. Hilda runs our education unit. She incorporated the danger of rings, flying rings in that. And we sent project work to lots of schools and pupils got involved and really sympathised and were quite worried about the seals. And the campaign has gained very good media support all through. Thanks, Sue. Yeah. I gave presentations to all three Norfolk coastal councils. I didn't hold back on the images of the seals, and as a result, they all support the campaign. Thanks, Sue. Wardens talk to people on the beach and go into shops. We've attended local events. And last year, I sailed around Britain to promote the campaign with our special uh, sale, and also wrote a book about it. And this was also covered by the BBC. Thanks, Sue. The awareness of people have certainly gone up tremendously, and these messages have come from members of the public. We've put up bright signs at beach entrances, which hopefully are deterring people from playing with the rings. Many shops have stopped selling them, but not all. Pets at home, with a lot of work by the RSPCA, put spokes across their dog flying rings, not ideal, but safer for seals, and the RNLI took them off sale from their website last year. Great Yarmouth Sea Life have given a home to Sealy along with our flying rings display. Thanks, Sue. With the council's North Norfolk District Council launched their Safer Seal campaign, highlighting the dangers of flying rings to seals, along with the need to keep a distance and keep dogs on leads. One of the great Yarmouth councillors, Barbara Wright, appealed to Asda and they have stopped selling flying rings in all their coastal stores. And King's Lynn became the first council in the country to prohibit the use of flying rings on their beaches. Thanks, Sue. Still, sadly, there are many, many seals being seen and photographed along the East Coast caught in plastic flying rings. We needed help. Sadly, in 2021, members of Cornwall Seal Research Trust started to see seals off their shores also caught in flying rings. And these are some of them. The bottom right one is a seal seen in Lundy Island. Okay, Sue and they created an amazing resources folder with different posters giving a really positive message and detailed letters to suppliers and shops. And it's available for anybody to use. You can find the link on the Seal Research Trust website. Mem Thanks, Sue. Members of the Seal Alliance groups have done a tremendous amount of campaigning so Joyce and Jeremy have found the names of directors and written to a lot of the very large suppliers and shops. Claire and Audrey went to visit shops. This is in Filey and all the shops pledged not to reorder the rings. They also did displays for local festivals during the summer, street fairs, and Andrea and Vanessa collected 34 flying rings from just one cove when they were wild swimming in Cornwall. Thanks, Sue. There have been some great innovative ideas as well. And on this next slide, you can see Lizzie being an eco float at the local carnival. Some great slogans. And this is a tiny part of a sand sculpture that the Yorkshire Seal group arranged 
to be put on to Scarborough Sands. Thanks, Sue. We're getting some good successes. Some of the biggest chains have stopped selling flying rings because of the seals. And CVS is a vet chain, and they stopped after appeals by the Gower Seal Group. Okay. I'm, onto the I'm just losing, I'm just not sure what slide we're on now. On the okay. fantastic publicity. And the fantastic publicity has been great publicity. Pembrokeshire Seal Research Trust got this coverage. And as Dan mentioned, the seal wings was actually the her, she was the biggest campaigner this year, and you've seen the pictures. Of Ah, uh, sorry, Jenny, I've broken up. Can I take over? Jenny, I'm going to take over because you've disappeared. So I'm just going to put you on mute and uh, continue. I'm ever so sorry. Uh, Okay, so I think what Jenny was trying to tell us is that Wings turned out to be our be best conservationist and best campaigner because she uh, managed to go viral on one of our radio uh, websites and had a million hits on her story, which has obviously um, reached an awful lot more people than uh, we've been able to prior to that. Jenny highlights that there are some uh, challenges with the next steps. Uh, more shops, we need uh, need them to stop selling them. We need all of you, please, to share uh, signage and leaflets and posters uh, to encourage bans. We need to raise awareness hugely, and we need to make it unacceptable to throw flying rings on a beach, a bit like smoking in public places is now. And the plan is that we will release another new petition on this, um, that, as I said before, about words, tones and approach is really critical, that we'll have hopefully the right messages in it for us all to share. Thank you very much, Jenny. Um, I'm sorry that you had such an, an issue with your broadband. And I have to say, well done, Hun, for uh, carrying on with that. You did a great job. So um, I'm just going to finish up with a bit of a round off. I was hoping we might have slightly more time for questions, but we were aiming to finish at half past. If you need to go at half past, I'm very happy for you to do that. But we will continue for a few minutes afterwards uh, if you wish to ask uh, any questions. But in my roundup, I think I've got some important messages uh, from our key participants. I'm just going to stop sharing my screen. And if you wish, uh, you can put your um, I would stop sharing it if I could. Mm, not going to work. Uh, Gareth, can you give me the thumbs up and tell you tell me if you can still hear me? Yeah, OK, that's great. So as a roundup, then, seals seem to be inspiring to a lot of us, which is wonderful. And they're very popular with the public and even get cross party support from these uh, seals create um, an inspiring team effort from the rest of us. And they really need us to be their voice and to be their champions and ambassadors taking things for them. Uh, Gareth, I love the fact that Gareth put photos which break our policy of seals looking at the camera because it makes a very important point that seals doing that have likely been disturbed. Obviously, it's slightly different in a rescue situation, but certainly in the wild, uh, we want to try and avoid photographs being shared of seals looking at the camera. For all of our work, people will only listen to us if we collect evidence. And we need all of the citizen scientists, that's you, around the coast in order to collect that evidence so that we can then take that evidence to decision makers to change things. We can't change it without evidence. It's clear that rescue, rehab and release makes a significant contribution to seal conservation. But we really do need more seal re uh, rehab space, particularly in the light of uh, climate change. And whether we like it or not, seals face multiple threats. So we need to take action and we need to take it on the quick wins. And the quick wins for me 
um, are disturbance and flying rings. Those are two priorities that if we all stayed 100 metres away from a seal and none of us threw flying rings uh, on beaches or near waterways, those two issues could go away tomorrow. And we have to remember that we together can make a difference if we pull together and work as a team. We can make a big difference for these amazing native species that we have on our shores. So well done to all the speakers, uh, the good, the bad, and there were no ugly ones, which is really great. There might have been some ugly issues, but our speakers were epic. So many, many, many thanks for that. Um, and what an amazing uh, year of activity um, we've done in the SEAL Alliance. I'm very proud of everything that we've achieved, but I'm hoping that the biggest achievement is yet to come when SEAL disturbance is made illegal. OK. I'm not able to stop sharing my screen, um, but I'm very happy to take questions. I know we have a couple in the chat. If you need to go, thank you so much. We've had 95 people on the call today, which is a record for us. Uh, so thank you very much for that. Uh, we do have a couple of questions if you're interested. Um, I'm just going to really try because this is being a real news. Oh, OK, so um, I'm not able to do that. Gareth, can you still see me and hear me? No, I fear I have gone. One too many presentations. Uh, nevertheless.